So chapter 8, if you're going to look at this, this is just about electronic configurations and periodicity. So we're just going to talk about the fourth quantum number and how the electron configurations related to it and then we move to periodic table. Okay, so in 1921, two German scientists by the name of Otto Stern and Walter Gerlach observed this electron spin magnetism. And as shown below, okay, a beam of hydrogen atoms divides in two while passing through a magnetic field. And one of them would give what? A positive one half value and a negative one half value. So based on our previous chapter, that's the fourth quantum number, the magnetic quantum number. So if you're going to look at them, how, okay, uh, this positive one half and negative one half is differentiated, we could say one is a counterclockwise while the other one is a clockwise. Okay, so this is the first orientation of the positive one half. And this is the other orientation of the negative one half. Now, what does it tell us? Okay. So it tells us that in every orbital, you can accommodate at most two electrons. Okay. And if you're going to look at this one here, we can arrange this orbital diagram. Uh, first, we could say into the so-called electron configuration. So this is just uh, the particular distribution of electrons among available subshells, okay? Or how orbitals are being filled up when you have available electrons. So synonymous to this electron configuration is the so-called orbital diagram. So an orbital diagram of an atom shows how the orbitals of a subshells are occupied by electrons. Orbitals are represented with a circle. Okay. I, you can represent it with a line or you can represent it with a box. Okay. And the electrons is represented with arrows up for ms uh, plus one half or down for ms uh, equals to negative one half. So it can be like this. It can be like this or it can be like this. So what you do is just the arrow that you have there. Okay, if, it, if this is the S, if it's what we call the P orbital, so you have three. If it's a D orbital, you have four subshells. Okay, now there's a, a what we call principle that dictates this one from Wolfgang Pauli. He said that no, not two electrons in one atom can have the same four quantum number. So that means within one orbital, you have two electrons of opposite spins, which also means that one orbital can hold the maximum of two electrons. So what does this mean? If you have an S subshell, you can have maximum two electrons. If you have a P subshell, you can have six electrons if you have a d subshell you can have 10 electrons if you have an f subshell you can have 14 electrons remember how did we predict the orbital usually we said the orbital is equal to what two sub l plus one okay if if it's s what's the value of l anyone What's the value of L when you have S subshell? You have zero, right? That's why this become one orbital. If you have P, that's equals to one. So you have, okay, uh, two L plus one. So two times one plus one, that becomes three. Now, any of these, uh, what we call subshells, if you are asked, in the question, how many orbit, uh, how many electrons are there in S orbital, or how many electrons are there in two P orbitals? So you just multiply by two the number of orbitals that you have in the subshells to get the number of the electrons. So those are the type of questions that you can 
be given on this thing. Now, if you're going to look at this, the lowest ground state uh, configuration or the lowest energy configuration of an atom is called the ground state. And any other allowed configuration represent an excited state. So, so, so what does this mean? Okay. Now, if you follow the ground state configuration, that means you filled up each of the orbitals according to the energy level. But if you have an excited state, you can put one orbital or excite one electron, okay, to a much higher or to an orbital that has a much higher energy level. Okay. So usually if we do this electron configuration, we, we follow the so-called Opbau principle or the building up. So this is the German word for building up. So it's a scheme used to reproduce the ground state electron configuration by successively filling subshells with electrons in a specific order. So you're building up, okay? So this order generally corresponds to filling the orbitals from lowest to highest energy. Now note that these energies are the total energy of the atom rather than the energy of the subshells alone. So what's the technique of this building up? Okay, so the simplest technique that I always tell my students is line up all the orbitals, okay, according to the subshell, and then put the principal quantum number. So you line up all the S, you line up all the P, you line up all the D, and then you line up all the F, and then you write an arrow diagonally, and you follow the arrow, and you can follow the sequence. So this is how your orbitals are being filled up, or this is how the orbitals are arranged, okay, in energy level. Now, there's also another way to know it. So why is it your 4S comes before the 3D? Okay, you can follow the so-called N plus L rule. What is that? All you need to do is, Add the number that corresponds to the, the principal quantum number and the asymmetrical quantum number. So, for instance, 4s versus 3d. So, what do you have here? You have 4 plus 0 because s means l is equal to 0. And then 3d, that is what? 3 plus what? What's the value of l when you have a d? So you have four, you have five. So that means this comes first before this one. So that's, that's the rule that you have there, okay? And you can follow it like uh, arranging in a Christmas tree like this one. Uh, another way that we can look is building up order is to correlate this subshell with the position on the periodic table. Since you have a periodic table, are given to you in your quiz and exam, I would suggest you follow this thing. Okay? So, how are you going to look at this one? So, you look at the periodic table. All the S is the first two groups there. All the P is the last six groups. Okay? Uh, the helium uh, would be considered on this side. And then you have the T and then the F. Now, well, how do you count them? So, first, so that's one. Second, that's two then three okay now if you're going to look at your how come so this is the thing that you need to remember how come the 3d comes in the fourth n is equals to four so if it's a d always remember that it will be n minus one so what does it mean so you have a four the, the one that you have here minus one so that's why you end up right uh, writing this as 3d and the same thing with the F. So F would come at six when N is equal to six. So the F, the rule is N minus two. That's why it's in, in the, uh, <clears throat> period, in the sixth period, if you go to the F, you write it as four F. If you go to the next one, you write it as five F because you have six minus two equals to four. 
and 7 minus 2 that is equals to 5. Okay? And all you need to do is uh, put or write first the highest energy level, the orbital with the highest energy level, and then work backward, fill up everything backward. Okay? So if you follow the sequence here, so if you find that this one, this is the highest, so all you need to do is fill up the one, the orbitals before that thing. Okay? Now the exception that I have is these two, the chromium and the copper. So instead of being a 4s2, 3d4 and a 4s2 3d9 they found out that the electron in the s orbital goes to the d orbital so the d orbital is preferably half filled or filled up so that, that's the only we could say exception that we have So, for instance, if we have bromine here, we can write it. If you're going to look at the periodic table, bromine, if I'm not mistaken, so that's 4P5. So, it's around here. If I'm not mistaken, chlorine, chlorine, bromine. This is how it is. Okay. So what we do, we count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So that's 4P5. And then fill up the one before it. Or there are some shortcut that you can do. But if you're asked for the complete electron configuration, so that you have to write all the orbitals. So as you can see, one of the shortcut that you have, so you can have here the so-called noble gases. So you can have a configuration wherein you write the noble gas before that. So whatever the noble gas here, and just write this, uh, what we call electron configuration at this period. Okay, so you can write it like this one. So this is the noble gas configuration. So you just look what is the noble gas beforehand. And if you're going to look this thing here, that's the configuration of your argon, the electron configuration of your argon. So instead of writing that, you just write there argon. And in some instances, they just ask you to write, okay, uh, the valence configuration. So usually the one that has the valence electron is just the NS, NP, Y uh, thing, the S and the P, which you call the representative element. So in that case, you can just uh, write the one that has the highest principal quantum number. So for bromine, this is the valence configuration. Okay? So the way that you're going to look at this one, for main group, representative element, an S or a P subshell is being filled. For a D block, transition elements, a D subshell is being filled. And for an F block, transition elements, an F subshell is being uh, what we call filled. Okay? So for main group elements, the valence configuration is in this form. And the A and the B is equal to the group number. So if you have group 5A, so it is an S2, P3 uh, configuration. All you need to look at it is the N. Okay, so let's try. So write the electron configuration of arsenic. So the first thing that we're going to do is determine what's the atomic number of arsenic. So arsenic is what? 33. So what we're going to do, we build up, so S would at most have 2, so 2S2, 2P6, 3S2, 
3p6, 4s2, 3d10, okay, 4p3. So 10, 10, 30, 33. So that's we could say the complete electron configuration. Now, if you ask the noble gas configuration, how are you going to write it? You still have argon, and then you have 4s2, 3d10, 4p3. Um, if you're asked the valence configuration, so this is just 4s2, 4p3. Okay? So can you get a uh, sure answer here? I'm happy at least your score is good during the last quiz. Okay? Because 7 and 8, I think, are the easy one. So whatever we discuss, usually you just change the element on it. Now, how about this one? You're asked to write the electron configuration and valence configuration of arsenic and zinc. We already write the valence configuration for arsenic. Okay. 4s2, 4p3. Now, if we're going to look at the sink, so we have to know what's the atomic number for that. So that's 18. And if we're going to do that, we can start with the whole thing. 2p6, 3s2, 3p6. 4s2, 10, 10, no, no, I think this one's 30, sorry, my fault, okay, so if I'm going to look at this, 1s2, 2s2, 4s2, 3d, 10, one, two, okay. So we have this as the electron configuration. And if we're going to look at, we can go arsenic again. That's 18. Okay, so you have 4s2, 3d10. Now for the valence configuration, since this is what we call a transition metal or transition element, you have to include the 3D because there, that's where you find it. Okay, so 4S2, 3D10 is the valence configuration. Oh, no. I hope they will not be low on that sounder. Okay, so that's uh, what we call writing electron configuration. So this is pretty straightforward and I expect everyone to get correct in questions like this. Okay, make it a sure points. Now, the next thing that we can do uh, discuss is the so-called Hans rule. So in 1927, Frederick Hunch discovered by experiment a rule for determining the lowest energy configuration of electrons in orbitals of a subshell. So what does the Hunch rule state? Okay, that the lowest energy arrangement of electron in a subshell is obtained by putting electrons into separate orbitals of the subshell with the same sphere before pairing electrons. So what does it mean if you have a degenerate orbitals? Or let's say you have a, a p orbitals. So let's say you have three electrons. So how are you going to fill up the three electrons in the degenerate orbitals? Are you going to fill it up like this? Or are you going to fill it up like this? Okay. So if we're going to look at this one here, okay. So how are we going to fill up this one? So based on this one, Hansel states that in the subshell, okay, 
You're going to fill it up first with the same spin before you pair the electron. So based on this one, okay, uh, what you're going to do is you build up each of the orbitals first. And then if you have an extra electron, that's the time you filled up the next orbital. So you distribute first the electrons within the orbitals. So this is the correct one. Okay, compared to this one. So that's what we call the Hans rule. Okay. So for a nitrogen, the orbital diagram would be like this. Okay. So you have 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. Okay. So as you could see there, you distribute okay, the electrons within the orbitals. So if you're going to write this one, it will be 1s2, 2s2, 2p3. So you, you distribute the electrons here, not putting them all, let's say, in two. So that's wrong. Okay. So for instance, if you're asked to write the orbital diagram for the ground state of nickel, so you end up writing it like this one. So this is what we call following Hans rule. So fully no two electrons is the same quantum number. Hans rule, electrons filling up uh, each of the orbitals first before pairing. Okay, so if we have uh, us, what's the problem with this one? We should be able to explain it by Hans rule or full fusion method or poly exclusion. So if you're asked, is this allowed? Okay, the answer is yes. What happened here? You have an excited state. Why? Because one of the electrons that should be filled up in the S goes to the P orbitals. So it's allowed, but in an excited condition. This one, is this allowed? The answer is no. Why? Because a P orbitals can accommodate at most six. The question is this allowed? 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 3p8. The answer is yes. It's allowed. And it is what? An excited state. Why? Because you don't have any electrons in the 4s. So that means most of the electrons jump up to a much higher state or a, a much higher orbital, or a orbital with higher energy level. Now, is this allowed? Most likely not, because D can only accommodate at most 10 electrons. And this one, is this allowed? Is this allowed? Anyone? Is this configuration allowed? Okay, the answer is no, it's not allowed because this one should be opposite spin. Okay, now the last part that we have, at least for this uh, quantum number part, is the magnetism property. And you can predict it using the electron configuration. So although an electron behaves like a tiny magnet, two electrons that are opposite in spin cancel each other. Now, only atoms with unpaired electron exhibit magnetic susceptibility. So the presence of an unpaired electron in an orbital means most likely it will exhibit magnetism. Okay. So there are two terms that they use, the so-called paramagnetic substance and the diamagnetic substance. So the paramagnetic substance, that's the one that can exhibit magnetism. 
the diamagnetic substance, they don't have magnetism. Now, how do you know if you have a paramagnetic or a diamagnetic? So the presence of the unpaired electrons means most likely you have a paramagnetic substance. Now, the presence, or if you only have what we call pair electrons, all your electrons are paired, so most likely it's diamagnetic. So we're going to look back at the example that we have here. Is nickel paramagnetic or diamagnetic? Anyone? Is nickel paramagnetic or diamagnetic? Based on this electron configuration. So to answer the questions like this, you have to write the configuration. So you see there the presence of pair, uh, unpaired electron. So this is a paramagnetic. How about the other one? Nitrogen. Is it paramagnetic or dia? So one unpaired, one unpaired, one unpaired. So this is a paramagnetic. Sink. What can you say about sink? Based on the valence configuration, it should be diamagnetic. Okay. Arsenic, on the other hand, if it's 4P3, so most likely it's like this. So this is also paramagnetic. So all you need to do is find if you have the presence of unpaired electron. And most likely, okay, you will have there a paramagnetic system. Okay. So those is the part that we have in the quantum numbers that is uh, discussed here. The next thing that we're going to discuss is about the periodic table. So in chapter two, we told you about why you call it the periodic table, because there's a repetition of properties, the periodic repetition of properties okay in the uh, what we call elements that is observed in the periodic table now although mendeleev is what we call uh, the father of the periodic table there are a lot of uh, people that made attempts in arranging the elements. Okay, so we're going to go as far as uh, what we call Doberiner, Johann Doberiner. So what he did, he, he he saw that some of the elements they exhibit the same properties. They call it in a triads. Okay, so. He found out that the lowest uh, molar mass and the highest molar mass, if you get the average of it, it is equal to another element. Okay, so this is a group of trees of elements that exhibited the same properties. And then after that, there's another one by the name of John Newlands. Okay, he developed this so-called law of octaves. So what does this law of octaves mean? If you arrange the periodic table, okay, according to mass, the eight periodic, uh, the eight elements would have the same property as the first element. So you know the do re mi fa sol la ti do, okay. So it's just repeating like that, the law of octaves. Uh, but unfortunately, it's not applicable beyond calcium, okay. So what happened here, Mendeleev and a German guy, Mayer, Lothar Mayer, arranged the periodic table okay, in terms of properties. Now, 
they doing it independently. Okay, so men, 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 uh, the advantage of Mendeley periodic table, which organize uh, elements by increasing atomic mass and with similar property in columns. In some places where there are missing elements, he predicted the properties. And what, does, what are those elements that he predicted the properties? Gallium, scandium, and germanium. He called it eka aluminum, eka boron, and eka silicon. Okay. So when he dis when they discovered these uh, elements, they found out that its property is very close to the one predicted by Mendeleev. That's why he was given the honor over Lothar Mayer. Mayer just arranged. Okay. Now, if you're going to look at the periodic table, I, I want you to look at the iodine. And what's the element before iodine? Is it tantalum? I want you to look at the atomic mass. Okay. So if you're going to look at the atomic mass of that, usually what? One has a higher uh, molar mass, uh, atomic mass compared to the other. So if you're going to look at that periodic table, is it tantalum or astatine? No, tellurium. Uh -huh. Okay, not tantalum. Tellurium versus uh, iodine. So if you're going to look at the atomic mass of these two, one is what? 127.6. Am I right? And the other one is 126.9. But, okay, Mendeleev arranged it in such a way, tellurium comes first because before iodine because the iodine property fits well with chlorine, bromine, and fluorine during that time. And the present periodic table owes its arrangement to a young guy by the name of Henry Mosley, an Englishman, so he arranged the periodic table instead of atomic mass, he arranged it in atomic number. And in that case, he confirmed that tellurium must come first before iodine. So unfortunately, Henry Mosley was one of the casualty of the Great War, which is the First World War. So imagine if he didn't die, he might have a lot of contribution to science okay, uh, during that time. Now, as I've told you, the periodic uh, table is based on the periodic law. It states that when the elements are arranged by atomic number, their physical and chemical uh, properties vary periodically. Okay? So, if we're going to look at uh, what we call these properties that we have here, we will look into details three properties in the periodic table, namely atomic radius, ionization energy, and electron affinity. So we're going to look at this, what we call trends that we have here. Okay. So the first thing that we have, atomic radius. Although there's no definite definition for atomic radius, we could just say that this is what? the distance from the outermost electron to the nucleus, okay? So if we're going to look at the atomic radius, so in an atom, we have the nucleus, which is very small. Maybe we put it like this, and then the outermost electron. So maybe we could say that's your atomic radius. Now, how do we look at the atomic radius in terms of the trends? If you go, within each group, okay, what happened? N equals to one, N equals to two, N equals to three, okay? So as the N or the principal quantum number increases, the atomic size increases. So atomic size is synonymous to atomic radius. 
So, top to bottom, okay, atomic radius increases. Why? Because top to bottom, there's an increase in N. So, this trend is explained by the fact that each successive shell is larger than the previous shell. Okay? Now, within a period, so this is left to right, what happened? There's an increase of a positive charge and there's also an increase in the negative charge. So opposite charges attract one another. So they become to be, uh, tend to become what? Smaller. So from left to right, the increase okay, of what we call atomic number results in an increase of positive charge and negative charge. So in that case, from left to right, atomic radius decreases. Okay, so atomic radius, top to bottom increases, left to right decreases. Remember that. Now, other item that can be uh, included as factor that affect the atomic radius is the so-called effective nuclear charge. Symbolize a set. Okay. SEP, uh, EFF is the effective, nuclear charge is the C. So effective nuclear charge is the positive charge that an electron experiences from the nucleus. It is equal to the nuclear charge, which is the C, minus shielding. Okay. So shielding or what we call screening from any intervening electron distribution. So what happened to the effective nuclear charge? So the effective nuclear charge increases across the period. Why? Okay. Because the shell number is the same across a period. Each successive atom experiences a stronger nuclear charge. As a result, the atomic size decreases across the period. Okay. So try to look at this as shielding. Remember, uh, you have the nucleus, and then you have the electrons in the inner orbitals. So this is how shielding is affected by uh, the inner electrons with the outermost electron. So it's just like if you're watching a view, uh, the view is in the center. So the people in front of you shielded your view because you're in the outermost electron. Okay. Now, across the period, this one increases, so most likely the effective nuclear charge uh, increases across the period. Now, if you're going to look at the trend that you have, so as you could see here, okay, there's a periodic repetition of the atomic size. So left to right, it, uh, what we uh, uh, in, uh, decrease, and then next shield there or next uh, energy level, it increases. So lithium smaller than sodium, sodium smaller than potassium, smaller than rubidium, smaller than cesium. But as they go left to right, they decreases. Okay? And if I'm going to put here a representation of the atomic radius, uh, this is what you're going to have. Okay, the smallest that you're going to have is helium, which is 31 picometer, and then the, uh, the largest atomic radius is cesium, which has 298 picometer. So the question that you're going to be asked here is you're given some set of element, and you are asked to arrange them from increasing atomic radius or decreasing atomic radio. So I, I, I would suggest make this as a sure points also. Okay. So the way that we're going to look at this, we have to find where they are in the periodic table. So you're provided with the periodic table. So all you need to know is know the trends. Atomic radio top to bottom increases, left to right decreases. So that means between these two, this is bigger. Okay? And then between these two, this is smaller. 
So if we're going to arrange it, maybe this one, this one, this one. So that's the arrangement. Okay. So I hope you be able to answer question like this. Because I think among the chapters, this is the easiest one. But that doesn't mean you don't have to study. Okay? Now, the next trend that we're going, the next property that we're going to study is first ionization energy. And we're going to relate this with the atomic ratios. Because in one way or another, they are related. So ionization energy, the first ionization energy, that's the minimum energy needed to remove the highest energy or the outermost electron from a neutral atom in the gaseous state, thereby forming a positive ion. Okay? So this is the energy that you need to be so that your uh, atom will become an ion. Okay? So this is the energy that is needed to remove an electron. Now, if it's the first ionization energy, that means the first electron. If it's the second ionization energy, the second electron. So the basis that you have here would be based on the periodic uh, electron configuration. So if you have, let's say, lithium, so it's 1s2, 2s1. So if it's the first ionization energy, okay, so that means from here to become here. If it's the second ionization energy, so I just put one electron coming out. So that means the energy that you need to remove one electron to become this one. Okay? And I would say the atomic radius has a uh, effect on that. So which do you think is easier to remove an electron? A big atom or a small atom? Okay? Because going down the group, it says here the first ionization energy decreases. Top to bottom, ionization energy decreases. Why? In terms of atomic radius, it increases. So the bigger the atom, the easier for the outermost electron to be removed. Okay? So this trend is explained by understanding that a smaller atom, the harder it is to remove an electron. So the larger the ionization energy. So if you're going to look at it top to bottom, since the uh, atomic radius increases, so the ionization energy decreases because it's easier to remove an electron from a bigger atom. Generally, it says ionization energy increases with atomic number. Ionization energy is proportional to the effective nuclear charge divided by the average distance between the electron and the nucleus. Okay. And if we're going to look at the trend from left to right, although there are some deviations that they have, in general, left to right, the ionization energy decreases. Some of the deviations that they have is this one. But they explain it in terms of the orbitals. So from S going to P, okay, and from the half field to the one that is filled up. So it takes less energy to remove an NP1 than an NS2, and it takes less energy to remove an NP4 than an NP3. So if you have it like this, it's less energy for you to remove this electron compared to one of the S orbital. Or if you have it like this, okay, it takes less energy if you have an NP4, which means one of them is like full, uh, filled, filled up compared to removing the one that is just like this one. But if you're going to look at the trend, okay, uh, it's just a small deviation here. So if you're going to look at general, ionization increases from left to right. 
Okay? And if you're going to look at the numbers of ionization energy presented like the size of a sphere or a circle here, so you could see the smallest atom has the highest ionization energy and the biggest atom has the lowest ionization energy. Now, in addition to this, you have to consider what's the difference between the first ionization energy versus the second ionization energy versus the third ionization energy, okay? So if you're going to remove the electrons successively from the atom, each ionization energy would usually increase because you're removing electron, okay? From a positive ion of increasing charge. So if you're going to look at the different successive ionization energy, as you could see in the helium, the difference here. The second ionization energy is much higher compared to the first ionization energy. Much more if you are removing it, let's say, from lithium, from 1s2 to 2s1, you're going to do it 1s2, and then you're going to do it 1s1. So this is the first ionization energy. This is the second ionization energy. So the amount that you have here is you're breaking a very stable condition, okay, to make it 1s1. And you're going to need a very high amount, not only two times. This is how many? More than 10 times the first ionization energy. Because you're breaking here the noble gas core electron, okay? Now, question that you're going to have very similar to what we have before. You're going to use the periodic table and then you're going to predict the trend. So for the instance here, so we could say this one is smaller here. So this is the highest ionization energy. This versus this, this is the lowest ionization energy. So if it's increasing, so you have here antimony, arsenic, bromine. And you can correlate here in ionization energy, the electron affinity, although if you're going to look at the trend of this electron affinity, it's a little bit messed up. So as you see in ionization energy, there are some, a little bit of discrepancy, but you can still see some general trend. Electron affinity is a little bit, uh, we could say uh, more complicated, okay? So what is electron affinity? If ionization energy results in the formation of cation, because you remove an electron, electron affinity, that's the energy associated for adding the electron in a neutral atom to give a negative ion. And usually a negative energy change indicates that a stable ion is formed. And the larger the negative number, the more stable the anion. And small negative energies indicate a less stable anion. And if you have a positive change, and the term it indicates that the anion. Okay. So if you're going to look at the electron affinity, as shown here, it's somewhat complicated than the ionization energy, just to give you an idea here. So if you're going to look at some of the group number, okay, the anion that they have formed is a stable, 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 not so stable, and then very stable and very stable. And if you're going to look at the trends, this is what you have. And usually I don't include questions like this, so not to uh, confuse the students, okay? So if you're going to look at the values of the electron affinity, as you could see here, this is how you look at them. You could see some sort of a trend, but not straightforward, because if you're going to look at here, electron affinity, what, increases until group seven, <laughs> if you look at here, and then it just go down again there. 
Okay? So, I'm just not going to put the trend on the electron affinity, but if you're going to put the trend on that, you will see that it's similar to ionization energy. Okay? Although I have a general uh, summary of all the trends at the end of this thing. Now, metallic property or the metallic character. So, how do we define metals? So, usually metals, they're the one that has the ability to form cations. And because of this, they have a tendency to have low ionization energy. Okay? So, those with high ionization energy tend to be nonmetals. So, we could say from left to right, okay, the metallic property decreases because ionization energy increases. Okay? And if you have what we call this metallic character, you can also say that the non-metallic character is the reverse. So as you go from left to right, the non-metallic property increases. And if you're going to look at some of the oxide that form with the acid, okay? So, so, so when you have oxide, that's the one that forms with oxygen. So if you form a basic oxide, that's the reaction of the oxygen with acid, okay? So most metal oxides are basic. So what, what does it mean? You have a metal here. So they tend to form basic solution. Now, if you have an acidic oxide, so that's the one that has, let's say, non-metals, like NO, okay? So they tend to form acidic solution. Now, if you have an amphoteric that reacts with both the acids and the base, okay, uh, you, you're going to have amphoteric oxide. Now, the next slides that we have here is just about the metals or the elements in the different group. I, I don't usually ask questions about this one, okay? But just uh, to tell you what they are, so group 1A, they're, they're called the alkali metals. With the exception of the hydrogen, all of them are metal. And then you have the group 2A, the alkaline earth metals. Okay? The, the, they're all metals. They are reactive. Uh, their reactivity increases down the group. The same thing, we could say the element. They are reactive. Okay, and the reactivity increases down the group. And then you have the group 3A. So boron is a metalloid and the other group 3A are metals. The group 4A is that contains the carbon. Okay, uh, carbon is non-metal. The other two are metalloids or semi-metals and then tin and lead are metals. So this is the group 4A oxide so as you could see it's a very colorful one okay and then you get the group 5a this is the nitrogen group so some are non-metal some are semi-metals and bismuth is metal and then group uh, 6a that's the chalcogens where uh, that contains the oxygen okay the 7A, seven, uh, seven the halogen, so that's uh, all of them are nonmetals. These are the fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. And then the group 8A, which is the noble gases. Now, if we're going to summarize what you need to know in the trends, I think everything is here in this slide. So as I told you, the electron affinity and ionization energy, they have the same trend. Left to right increases, top to bottom decreases. Atomic radius, left to right decreases, top to bottom increases. Metallic property decreases from left to right, increases from top to bottom. Non-metallic property increases from left to right, decreases from top to bottom. And if we're going to put some of the comparative uh, description here you can end up like this one so as you can see we didn't discuss electronegativity it will be discussed in chapter nine which is the uh, ability to attract electrons to itself okay 
So question. Before I talk about the uh, the thing that I, I think uh, very important one, and I'm going to put up the record, the, the, the stuff that we have after this. I'm not going to include it in the recording. But it will be helpful because uh, I see some sort of uh, disparity. Some students are so high, some students are so low. Okay, and usually during summer, I want the student to do well. If I'm giving the choice 